Hey everybody, this is our revision lecture on evolution. So I'll be covering basically all of the concepts that you need to know for the evolution topic. Uh, I'll go into a moderate amount of detail, not as much as in all the other instructional videos, but this should, this will cover all of the basics um, for evolution. Okay. So we start the evolution topic by looking at the geological time scale. And remember that the geologic time scale is basically just a timeline of the history of the earth. Timeline of the history of earth. And it's broken up into eons and periods, which all have uh, names, obviously. Some of the ones you might be familiar with are uh, the Jurassic period, uh, the Cretaceous period, and the Triassic period. These are the times of when the large and most famous dinosaurs lived. Obviously, that's where Jurassic Park came from. But remembering dinosaurs didn't die out, they're still living as birds. So most of the dinosaurs went extinct at the end of the Cretaceous period, but the birds survived to this day. Okay, and scientists have figured out the geologic time scale by using the principle of continental drift. And continental drift has had a huge effect on life and different species as they've evolved over time. So we always want to consider what's happened in terms of the continents and the geology of the Earth. We want to consider that alongside what's happened to species and how they've evolved. Because the Earth has affected evolution and some species and evolution has affected the Earth's geology as well. So remember, continental drift is basically the process that continents move over time. It happens really slowly. This is a slow process, but it's still a few centimeters each year. So we can actually measure Australia moving at the moment using satellites, and Australia is moving north towards the equator at about two centimeters every year. And scientists have also discovered that back in the past, the continents weren't as they were today. They were actually joined together into supercontinents. And these are the supercontinents from the last 300 million years or so. So Pangaea was about 300 million years ago. And that was a supercontinent which contained all of the continents joined together into one. And then Pangaea broke up basically in half. About 150 million years ago it started to break up. And then the southern half of Pangaea we call Gondwana. And that contains all the southern hemisphere continents that, that are in the south today. So South America, Africa, Antarctica, and Australia. And then the northern half of Pangaea broke off into Laurasia, which contains the northern main continents, which are obviously North America and uh, Eurasia, so Europe and Asia. Also Greenland is in there as well. Okay. Well, as scientists learned more about continental drift, they found more and more evidence that actually proves that it's true. And so that nowadays we consider continental drift to be a theory, which means we are basically certain that it's true. So there are three bits of evidence that prove continental drift is true. The first one is complementary coastlines, which basically says that when you look at a map, lots of the continents seem to fit together like a puzzle. You might have noticed this when you were looking at maps and when you were first learning about the shape of all the continents, they really look like they fit together like puzzle pieces, particularly South America and Africa here. 
they seem to join perfectly. Um, and that's because they were joined back when the continents were joined as a supercontinent. Uh, the other, another bit of evidence is the fact that some fossil species are found across different continents, which are now completely separated by oceans. And we call this biogeography. So having a look here at this fossil species, it's found across South America and Africa, but those two continents now are separated by the entire Atlantic Ocean. So that little um, four-legged reptile wouldn't be able to move between those two continents. So the only way that it could have lived on the two continents is if they were once joined together. So that's how, that's another bit of evidence that proves continental drift is true. And then the last one is looking actually inside rocks. Scientists, sorry, at the structure of rocks and scientists can look at the scrapes on the rocks, which is caused by glaciers. And they can actually look at the direction that glaciers were flowing, and they can work out which land was covered by glaciers in the past. And if we look at Gondwana, scientists have figured out there was once one giant glacier covering all these parts of the continents. And it all was moving outwards, um, following the direction of these arrows here. So that's a more evidence that the continents were once joined together and they were once covered by one giant glacier. That's much more likely than having six separate glaciers all um, at different times and in different places. So we can call this bit of evidence um, remnants or evidence in the rocks. All right. The other important reason why evolution, why scientists who study evolution also look at rocks is because fossils are found in rocks. Obviously fossils, they're pure evidence that something was once living millions of years ago. So remember, there's a few different types of fossils. You can have molds, which is the outside of a dead organism or casts, which is basically the filled in space. And you can also have trace fossils, which are footprints or imprints, things like that. But fossils are just evidence of past life, essentially, that's found in rock. Okay. Probably the two most important definitions to know in this topic are species and population. So when we talk about a species, we mean a group of organisms that can breed among themselves to produce fertile offspring. That's the cleanest definition. Fertile offspring means that their offspring, their children, can also breed and have children as well. So here, if we're looking at these octopus, they are one species because they can breed amongst themselves, but they can't breed with the green seahorses over here, or with the blue sharks or the red crabs. So they are all different species. <clears throat> okay. And then when we talk about a population, we're then talking about a specific species in particular living in a different location. So if we look at the purple octopus over here, You've got one group of octopus living over here. It might be in an ocean in the north of the continent. And then there's another group of octopus living down here, and they're living in a different part of the continent. So a population is a group of organisms of the same species that are living in a certain place. So they're still the same species. If an octopus goes from this population and it manages to swim over to this population, it will still be able to breed with any of the other octopus because it's still the same species. Okay.
now we're getting onto the heart of the topic, which is how does evolution actually occur? So, in short, evolution occurs by natural selection. And technically, it is the theory of natural selection, which means there is a whole, a whole heap of evidence that proves natural selection is true, and we assume and we accept that it's true nowadays because there's just so much evidence behind it. So in short, natural selection just means survival of the fittest, where individuals in a species or in a population are fitter than other individuals, and so some have a better chance of surviving than the others. Always make sure you're talking about the individuals in a population or in a species. So the two scientists you also need to know are Charles Darwin and Alfred Wallace. Remember, both of them came up with the idea of natural selection basically at the same time, but in completely different parts of the world as they were studying different locations. So they both developed the theory of natural selection Give Alfred Wallace a leg up because no one remembers him. Charles Darwin gets all the credit. But Wallace did just as much work as Charles Darwin in helping us learn about evolution. All right. So survival of the fittest is the basic explanation. But we use an acronym to learn the different steps of how natural selection actually happens. So we use VISTA. It's a nice easy one to remember. So V in VISTA stands for variation. The fact that in a population of one species, there are differences. So here, the rabbits, some have brown fur, some have white fur. There's variation between individuals. And that's necessary. You can't have evolution if there's no variation. The next uh, letter is I, which stands for inheritance. because all that variation is inherited from one generation to the next. So if brown rabbits breed together, they're most likely going to have a brown rabbit uh, baby. So the variation is passed on from generation to generation. And if there was no inheritance, evolution couldn't happen either. Okay, S is survival and reproduction. So since individuals are different and ve there's variation, that means some individuals have a more likely chance of surviving and reproducing to make babies and continue the species. So there's a constant battle for survival, and only the fittest will survive. That is the key. And so if the fittest are surviving, then they're the ones passing on their genes, and that means they're passing on the beneficial traits to the next generation. Okay, T is just time because survival and reproduction happens over lots and lots of generations. Although it can happen quite quickly as well, within just a few generations. But after a certain amount of time, suddenly the popula- well, not suddenly, but eventually the population becomes adapted to where it's living. So we say A is adaptation. The beneficial traits are surviving, and in this case of the rabbits, the brown fur is surviving more and reproducing more. So over time, the white rabbits are reducing. And then if we look at the whole population of rabbits, most of them are brown now, and they're better adapted to living in this uh, desert where they, where they are. Obviously because their brown fur is camouflaging them. Okay. 
Going back to fossils, we also need to know the process of how fossils actually get made, which is called fossilization. So it's a pretty simple four step process. The first step obviously is the organism has to die and it falls to the bottom of its lake or ocean if it's living in a, an aquatic environment or it falls to the ground wherever it was living. Okay, the next step is once the organism has died over millions of years, lots of sediment, so dirt or um, rocks start to build up on top of that dead organism. So essentially, the organism gets buried underneath sediment. Buried under sediment. And then that sediment eventually turns to rock. So the fossil gets buried underground. Well, the organism does. And then once it gets buried, then that organism starts to turn to turn into stone. And we call that mineralization because all of the living tissue transforms into uh, minerals that make up rock. And now we've made our fossil. Okay. But the fossil's buried deep underground, so the only way to find it is for scientists to dig, uh, to dig down if they can, or most likely, um, after millions of years, because mountains push rock and they bend rock, and then the weather erodes the top rocks, fossils can actually appear back at ground level again. So um, weathering causes fossils to be exposed. So we actually don't need to go digging for many fossils because we can find them in the top, the top layer of the rock or just even on the ground. Okay. Well, the other really useful thing about fossils, other than the fact that they prove what a species looked like, is we can find out when that species was actually living. Um, and we call that dating a fossil. So there were two main ways for finding the age of fossils. The first one's not very accurate. It is just called relative dating. And the other method is called absolute dating, which is much more accurate and it actually gives us a, a period of time when that species or when that fossil was made. Or relatively accurate anyway, in terms of geology. Okay. So when we do relative dating, we use the process called stratigraphy, which just means looking at the layers. And so we look at the layers of rock and we know that the older rocks must have been formed the earliest. And they must be lower down in the layers of rock. So any fossils that are in the lower layers, they must have been made earlier than fossils up in the higher layers. So in this example here, we've got rock layer D, it must have been first. So this little mollusk shell, it must be the oldest fossil in this area. And then we keep looking at the higher and higher layers and we see which fossils are the next oldest. So layer B must be the next oldest and it's containing this bone here so the bone is the next oldest um, and then we go up to layer f up here it's got this um, leg bone so then that's the next oldest and then right at the top here we've got an elephant skull and that's in the most recent rock layer so that must be the youngest fossil out of our four so when we do stratigraphy, all we can do is say, what's the oldest fossil, what's the youngest, and put them in order. So it's really just ordering fossils by age, which is still useful, but it's not giving us an actual date. 
but the most useful one obviously is absolute dating. So what scientists do is they take samples of the minerals in the fossil, because fossils are made of rock, and they measure um, certain amounts of different radioactive chemicals that are found in that mineral. So they measure it, they make a half-life graph, So they measure radioactive minerals, sorry, they measure radioactive isotopes that are in the mineral. And then they can make a graph and they can use those graphs of radioactive decay to actually find out the age of that fossil. And then they can go back to the geological time scale and we can put all these fossils on the time scale and start to well and to continue building our tree of life for all the species and when they lived all right so evolution is really important it's how species change and how they adapt to their environment but speciation is also really important because this is how new species actually get made Remember, there are millions of species living on Earth at the moment, plus many, many more that have lived on Earth but have gone extinct. And the statistic is something like, uh, it's in the high 90s, so it's around 98% of all species that have ever lived have now gone extinct. But there are still millions of species alive today, and this is how a new species gets made. So we've got another acronym to remember this one. It is INRS, I-N-R-S. So, I in the INRS stands for isolation. So there's a starting population of whatever species we're looking at. We've got the red crabs at the start here in this one. So the starting population, they're all living, just doing their thing, living their life. And then somehow that population gets isolated. It gets split in half or a few individuals um, move to another location. Maybe they swim across to a different island and now they're living over in a different place. And then once the two species are isolated, then natural selection just continues to happen as it always does. So N is natural selection. But since they're living in slightly different locations now, they're going to evolve slightly differently and they'll adapt slightly differently to where they're living. And so we can see here the population of crabs living in the southern section, they've now evolved to be slightly larger and to be pink. Whereas the original population, they haven't really changed much um, as evolution has happened. And once enough natural selection happens, then the most important thing is a reproductive barrier is made. Reproductive barrier. So this just means something has evolved now so that these different populations, they can't breed anymore. So even if we took some pink crabs and brought them back to the original place and tried to get them together and to breed with the red crabs, there's some kind of barrier that's stopping them. Maybe they don't recognize each other, maybe they physically can't mate anymore, or they mate at different times of the year. So as soon as there's a reproductive barrier, now we say that these have become different species. The two different populations, they're not just different populations anymore, they're their new species. So the S just means speciation. So our species one, it's still the red swimmer crab, but species two, we now call it something new. So it's the purple swimmer crab and the scientists would give it a new scientific name um, 
suited to what it looks like. All right. The last couple of sections are all about the two main types of evolution. So evolution tends to happen in these two ways. The first one is divergent evolution and the other one was convergent evolution. And you always want to be thinking of these pictures here because this is what the words mean in English, right? So divergence means moving away from something and convergence means moving towards something. So divergent evolution, that is when two, when we start with one species or two really closely related species and they evolve to look more different. So we say closely related species evolve to be more different. They move away from each other, they evolve away from each other. And then convergent is the exact opposite. So we're thinking evolving towards something. They don't evolve to be the same species, but they evolve to look similar. So convergent evolution, we say, is when two unrelated species evolve to look more similar and to be more similar. Two unrelated, although technically we want to say distantly related, because every species is evolved if you go, every species is related if you go back far enough. So two distantly related species evolve to be more similar. Think about uh, an echidna in Australia and a hedgehog in America. Echidnas are marsupials and, and hedgehogs are placental mammals, but they look so similar because they've evolved um, in similar environments. Okay. And can, to go along with divergent and convergent evolution, they tend to produce certain structures in different species. And we call these homologous and analogous traits. Um, the homologous traits, these are produced by divergent evolution. So always remember, divergent makes homologous traits and convergent makes analogous traits. That's the other one. So let's have a look at an example of homologous traits. So here's an example of divergent evolution. We've got an ancient arthropod, which is um, an invertebrate. It doesn't have a backbone. And it diverged into these two groups of species. It diverged into spiders, and it also diverged into centipedes over millions of years. So these two species are related. They've come from a common ancestor, which was this ancient arthropod. So it's clearly divergent evolution. But then if we look at a particular trait or a structure, like the mouth parts here of the spider, and the antennae of the centipede. These two mouth parts have come from the ancient species that had the same mouth parts. But now, in each species, they're used for something different. So in a spider, it's using its fangs for biting, and in the, ant uh, and the antennae in the centipede, they're used for sensing as the centipede walks along. So fangs and antennae, we call homologous we say are homologous. And the simple definition is that they're um, related parts or related structures and they've come from a common ancestor. They can have a different function, like in this example, or they can have the same function. 
like our legs are homologous with um, a gorilla's legs because uh, they're both used for walking. So they're related to some common ancestor. They may be similar or may have the same function. Sorry, they may be similar or different. May have the same or different function. All right, and then on the other hand, convergent evolution produces analogous structures. So here we've got an example of convergent evolution where we had um, an ancient marsupial and a rodent. So rodents are placental mammals. They're a completely different group of mammals. So these are not closely related at all. But then over time, this marsupial evolved into the sugar glider which has these amazing skin folds here that can be used for gliding between the trees. You might have seen one of these in Australia. Sugar gliders are native to, to us here in Australia. But also over in the Northern Hemisphere, some ancient rodents evolved into these flying squirrels. And they've got really, really similar looking skin folds and they can also glide between the trees. So they look almost identical the glider and the squirrel, but they haven't come from a common ancestor. So when we look at the skin folds, we say that these are analogous structures because they're unrelated structures. They've evolved completely separately. Unrelated structures, but importantly, they have the same function. Another example of some analogous structures would be the tail of a fish and the tail of a dolphin. So they look really similar. They both help them to swim through the water, but they've come from completely different parts of evolution because dolphins are mammals. They've come from land originally. So the dolphin's ancestors had legs. The legs evolved into fins. So that's a completely different tail to the tail that fish have. All right. And the final section is what are the bits of evidence that we can actually use to prove evolution? And here they are, there's six of them. They should be pretty familiar. This is, um, sorry, the first one is selective breeding. So this is the fact that humans, we can breed plants and animals and we can see the evolution happening as we breed them. That's how we've made different, different breeds of dogs, all the different fruits and vegetables that we like to eat, and how we've made domesticated animals like horses and cows and things like that. Then we also have comparative anatomy. And comparative anatomy, we're comparing the similarities and differences of our physical structure, of our bodies. And so here is the foreleg, the front leg of a whole lot of different species, and they're all related to each other and they have the same bones. So our forearm and a horse's front leg and a whale's flipper and a turtle's front leg and a frog and a bird, these are all homologous structures which proves that we were all related to a common ancestor. So that's the benefit of comparative anatomy. Scientists can also compare embryos as well, and we call that comparative embryology. And when you go back far enough, when you look at really early embryos, which is here, Look how similar they all look. So a fish embryo and a rabbit, sorry, and a chicken embryo and a pig and a human, all our embryos look so similar when they're really young. So that's more evidence that evolution is true. We've also got the fossil record. 
because the more fossils we find, um, the more gaps we can fill in in the story of evolution. And we can find all these species in between modern day species that we haven't, that we didn't know existed. So we can find all the animals that have really small wings, um, which were the ancestors of birds. And we can see how the wing evolved over time by looking at all the fossils as we find them. We also have chemical similarity, which is the fact that every single species on Earth uses DNA and it uses proteins and it does the same types of chemical reactions in our cells. Even though we look totally different, humans compared to trees or to fungi, if you zoom into our cells, we are doing pretty much the same types of chemical reactions and many of them are exactly the same. And then lastly, this is the big one, this is just observable evolution. So there are tons of examples where scientists can go out and they can actually measure evolution happening uh, right now in the present day and we can see these changes. So clear proof that evolution is true and happening. Alright, that is the whole topic of evolution.